I'm better known as Ms. Jacobs around here. And I consider myself one of the more fortunate people in the world because I really love the work that I do. I've been teaching for over 40 years, working mostly with young children. And through the course of that time, I've come to understand why Jesus held this particular segment of the population in such high regard. One of my first encounters of theology was when I developed and taught a Sunday school program for four and five-year-old children. <clears throat> I had started this program mainly because I found going to Mass with my young children was not exactly an uplifting religious experience. <laughs> In fact, it often seemed more like a penance, both for me and for my squirmy active children. I recall that the parish we were attending at the time had the practice of uh, ringing bells at the sacred moment of consecration. And one Sunday, just as the priest was elevating the host, the shrill voice of my three-year-old son rang through the church. Mommy, is that the ice cream man? <laughs> it was at this time that I came to the realization that my children needed a form of catechesis suited to their level of understanding. What I found at the time was that no such program existed in the Catholic Church, so my sister and I developed a program. We discovered that Protestants had been dis uh, developing Sunday school programs for quite some time, and we found many resources in those communities, but we wanted a program designed for little Catholics. So we wrote and taught the program in our respective parishes. It was an interesting task to develop that program because before we could write a program that we wanted to teach, we had to spend a lot of time contemplating just what it was that we believed. When my husband and I moved to Park Ridge, we had two more children, bringing our total to five kids. When one of my younger sons was three, I realized that he was never likely to become the star of a formal preschool class, but he did need to develop some social skills that would indicate to him that he actually was not the center of the universe. So what I did was invite a select group of friends to send their three-year-olds to my house once a week for a playgroup that was actually a religion class. I not only wanted to help my son become more socially acceptable, but I also wanted to discover if children as young as three could develop religious concepts. I learned so much that year. One week, the lesson was about the miracle of Jesus walking on the water. I had made some very basic stick puppets, and the children sat in front of our sofa while I crouched behind being the puppeteer. The children appeared to be mesmerized, and I was quite proud of my dramatic prowess until the following week. I began by reviewing the previous lesson. Kids, do you remember what last week's story was about? I asked brightly. Totally blank stares. Remember the exciting story of how Jesus walked on the water, I pleaded? Still no response. Finally, Patrick, a very bright child, said, So what? Superman does that kind of stuff all the time. <laughs> well then, I said a bit gruffly, so what was that story about? He looked at me like someone who was a bit slow, and he said, that was the story of how Jesus saved his friends when they were in a storm. I was speechless. My God, I thought, that is what the story is about. It humbled me to know that I had learned more from that child than he had learned from me. In the following years, I became the director and teacher in the preschool religion program at Mary Cedar Wisdom Parish. This was a Sunday school program for four and five-year-old children. We met every Sunday during the nine o'clock mass. One week, the lesson was about the story of the prodigal son. I again did a puppet show using simple stick puppets, and the children sat as entranced as if they were watching professional theater. And when the show was finished, I began discussing the story with the children. We talked about how the father was so happy that his son came back that he had a big party to celebrate. And then we talked about the reaction of the older son. And I said, I can understand why the brother was angry. After all, he stayed on the farm working all that time. Heads nodded in agreement. And then a darling ponytail cherub looked up at me with puzzled wide eyes, and she uttered one of the most profound theological statements I've ever heard. She said, but I don't get why the brother was so mad. Isn't everyone invited to the party? That remark absolutely <laughs> stunned me. And even though that child is now an adult, her question still remains with me as a deep crystallization of Catholic theology. Isn't that what Jesus came to tell us? That everyone indeed is invited to the party? No matter where you're coming from or what path you get to take, take to get there, every person is invited to the party. 
I have been teaching at St. Paul of the Cross now for 23 years, mostly in first grade. <clears throat> Among other things, I teach children how to read, how to get to 100, how many continents there are, what the force of a magnitude go through, but the most important thing I teach them is where they were going, how they will get there, and what they're required to do on the journey. One of the first concepts I present during the first weeks of religion class is the idea of symbol. Something can stand for something else. They learn that when we light a candle, it is a symbol of Jesus coming among us and lighting our lives. They learn that the water poured in baptism is a sign of life itself, God's life among us and in us. We point out the many symbols and Bible stories that we tell the children. The 40 days that Noah stayed on the ark and the 40 days that Jesus prayed in the desert really mean a very long time. The children understand this. One March I was reading the story of St. Patrick and the book had a section about legends surrounding this great saint. One legend was about St. Patrick driving the snakes out of Ireland. One of the children asked me, is this a true story? I was pondering how to answer when a voice came from under the chair I was sitting on. It was the voice of Jack, who preferred to listen to stories from under my chair. The voice said, maybe it's that symbol stuff. You know, how when you told us about Adam and Eve, you told us the snake was a symbol of evil? Maybe the story is about how St. Patrick helped drive evil out of Ireland. <laughs> I'm telling you, sometimes they take my breath away. I have often heard it say, said that our children are the future of the church, and that is true. What I've come to tell you tonight is that the children are the present of our church. They are capable of fully participating in the ancient traditions and the beautiful liturgies of our church, and they are avidly desirous of doing so. In our school, children go to Mass at least once a week. During Advent and Lent, there are afternoon Masses for students from 2nd to 8th grade. When Father Carl was pastor here, I asked if he thought we could have special services at that time for the very young children in our school, preschool, kindergarten, and first grade. He thought it was a good idea, so that's what we do. Every Tuesday afternoon during Advent and Lent, we hold these services in Holy Family Chapel. The children act as lectors, gift bearers, leaders of song. The scripture readings are from the Sunday lectionary and the music is geared to their young voices. And sing they do. Their very enthusiastic voices fill the church, and the music is sometimes accompanied by liturgical dance, especially by the preschoolers. <laughs> the children love the services, and most importantly, they look forward to going to church. If you were to come to one of these services, and you're all invited, you would see the church of the present. You would see the spirit at work in a congregation that is quite literally spirited. In our religion classes, we use a published religion uh, text, but at various times of the year, we put the book aside and do special units. During Advent, we do the Bible banner. Each first grade class has a large felt banner hung with little presents. Each day, we all gather together to hear a Bible story. These stories begin with the story of creation and continue to trace the ancestry of Jesus until the story of his birth. After the story is read, the children return to their homerooms and one child is picked to open the numbered package that reveals a symbol of that story. In January, right about now, around Martin Luther King Day, we do a two-week unit on prejudice and discrimination. During this unit, we present the ideas of social justice, looking at models of courage and nonviolence, not only in Martin Luther King, but also in people like Rosa Parks, Gandhi, and of course, Jesus himself. One of the most important units we do is the one right around Easter, death and dying. The kids love this unit. Many kids, many adults are uncomfortable talking or even thinking about this topic and they certainly don't want to be talking about it with little children. Some people think that children should be shielded from the whole concept of death. But even if that were desirable, and it certainly isn't, it would be impossible. Death is part of every newscast, many TV shows, and I don't know of a single family that has not been touched in some way by the death of a loved one. Death is inevitable and it is painful, but we are an Easter people, and the sting of death is tempered by the knowledge that death is the beginning of new life. Rather than being shielded from death, children should be introduced to the idea as early as possible. For our very young children, we first present death as part of life. 
We plant seeds and bulbs and watch as they come to new life. We see the new life of a caterpillar as it turns into a butterfly. We see how happy a chick is when it emerges from the crowded egg. We look at the life cycle of frogs, of other animals, and of people. The children are told very early on that one day they too will die. But even if they live to be a hundred, this is just the short beginning of a life that will go on forever. They are told that their soul is forever in the hand of God and no harm can touch it. Children are wonderful believers and they accept this central concept of Christianity with deep faith. One year, a mom of one of my students whose own mother had died suddenly said, Mrs. Jacobs, I don't know how we would have gotten through this without the wisdom and faith of our little girl. So children should be introduced to death as soon as possible. But the first thing we need to do is explain what death is, what it means to die. When somebody dies, it means their body doesn't work anymore. Whatever made that happen, that's the bottom line. Their body doesn't work anymore. Also, we need to use the right terminology. Saying someone passed on, or worse yet, went to sleep, are phrases that are confusing and frightening. One little boy, on being told that his mom had lost the baby, shouted, Well, tell her to go find it! <laughs> Children should not be told that someone has turned into an angel. I hate the perennial favorite, the littlest angel. Hope I'm not standing on any toes here, but... Number one, a little boy dies. And although children should be told that they're going to die someday, they should not have to worry that it's right around the corner. Secondly, when he gets to heaven, he's all alone. This is a child's worst fear. And then, a big angel frowns at him for being careless. Now, who wants to go to heaven like that? We tell the children that only God knows how long a person will live, and that that person that they are now is the person that they will be for eternity. We tell them that God allows us to live until we can become, we have the chance to become, the most important and the best person that we can be. We tell them that it's okay to be sad and to cry, that even Jesus cried when his friend died, but we're happy too because that person has been welcomed by all the people in the family who have gone before them and are so happy in heaven. It is awesome to realize how much children understand of things that are often hard to absorb. When one of my sons was two and a half, his godfather, who was only 23, died in a tragic drowning accident. I was trying to explain why Timmy was not going to come over and play with him anymore. I explained that Timmy's body had died, but the important part of him, his soul, would never die. And little David, who was already at that age an avid Star Wars fan, said, Oh, that's just like Obi-Wan Kenobi. Exactly. <laughs> Sometimes children have been told about heaven, I mean hell and purgatory, and those ideas need to be clarified. We explain that hell is when you choose to live without love or without God in your life, and they get it. One day, six-year-old Bobby came up to my desk during playtime and he said, You know what, Mrs. Jacobs? Hell is not a place. You're still alive if you're in hell. It's a place like if you're mean to people, right? There must be something about playtime that encourages contemplation. Another year, Darren came up to my desk during playtime and he said, you go on a vacation, but then you're glad to go home. What a comforting concept. Your vacation can be wonderful, or horrid as some vacations unfortunately are, but ultimately, Darren is right. We're all on our way home. I have known people who believe that it is unfair to impose religious beliefs on children. They think that a child should be free to choose whatever faith and beliefs they want when they're adults. I think that's such flawed thinking. One would not feed a child only bread and milk so that as an adult the child can choose the food that is more appealing. One would not fail to expose a child to music or art or literature because they might have different tastes as adults. So it is with religion. Obviously, I'm biased for Catholic school education, but religious education can take place in many venues, in many forms. Children are very spiritual beings, and that aspect of their being should be fostered and fed like any other part of their lives. They should learn that things can be real, even if they cannot be perceived with our senses. 
They should be able to participate in religious prayer, liturgies, and celebrations. They should be made to feel that they are part of a community of believers. And they should learn that there is a God that created them and loves them. And they should always be aware that they are on their way home. Are there any questions or comments? Yes? Um, one little anecdote could you share with us? Uh, when we were having the um, pads thing and uh, the one, one of your former students got up to the microphone. Oh, that was so impressive to me. I had um, taught the kids a song, Put on Love Every Day, Put on Love with Your Sneakers, Put on Love with Your Old Blue Jeans, Put on Love with Your Sunday Clothes, Put on Love Every Day. And we had sung it over and over and over. And when we had that absolutely horrid pads meeting, the first one down here, and there was so much hatred being sprung around this room. And one of my former students, who was by that time an adult, stood up and she said, You know what? Why are we forgetting what Mrs. Jacobs taught us? Put on love every day. And it brought tears to my eyes because sometimes you wonder if what you're doing is having any impact at all. And it does. Uh, stories are such a powerful, powerful way of transmitting religious concepts. Not just Bible stories, of course, they're wonderful too. But there are lots of trade books. I had uh, read a book called uh, Miss Rumpheus, and uh, that's a wonderful book. It's uh, based on the life of the author's great, great, great aunt, I think. And uh, her grandfather told her that every person had a job to do, and that job was to make the world a more beautiful place. And so she was a librarian, and then she traveled all over, and then she did all things, and then she would, became handicapped. And she looked out the window, and she saw lupins growing. And she decided that it was going to be her job to sprinkle lupin seeds all over where she lived. Lupins are these beautiful blue spiky flowers, a blue and, um, and a kind of a rosy color. And the end of the story is that she did that, and she, she did so many lupin seeds that her whole town was covered with lupin seeds. And so we explained to the kids that the lupin seeds are a symbol of the acts of kindness and love that every person is called to, to uh, bring to the world. So one year, a family had two children. They were very par far apart in age. The uh, older child was a shy girl, and she, by that time she was, I think, either in a first year of high school or an eighth grader, and then they were bringing in a first grader to meet me. And so the mom says to this poor girl, um, so tell Mrs. Jacobs, what do you remember about first grade? Well, the poor kid is just standing there like, I, I don't know, you know. And she finally said, well, I remember you read us a story about a woman who spread lupin seeds all over the world. And I thought, okay, good. I mean, if that's all she remembers, that's, that's good. So um, that is my message today, that they need to be given something substantial that no child can grow up groundless and rudderless without a faith commitment. Yes? I don't know, but there's an awful lot packed in that little person of you. <laughs> <laughs> I would just love to go back to preschool and sit in this class. Uh, you're welcome. Anytime I will have you uh, cut out things and uh, put things on the bulletin board, so anytime you want to drop in, I have an open classroom. I, I have something to add to that. Coming to your services for Advent um, have been so meaningful to our family, but to me. And you're incredible. And if Catholic Church ever lets someone be a priest, you should be a priest. But your messages are always so clear. You don't talk down to the children. You talk to them. And they, I mean, the conversations that we have after your services are just incredible. So thank you for what you do. Well, thank you. And you have wonderful kids, too. <laughs> so, but it's, um, it's just amazing to me uh, to realize how much even a two-year-old can understand. They may not be always be able to articulate, but they certainly can get it. 
And even if there is some reason why your child can't be in Catholic school, and I know there are many valid reasons for that, they need something. You can have services in your own house. We've done that. Um, every Christmas, our family, uh, I, I come from, fortunately, a huge family, a cast of thousands. And uh, we, um, every year, the kids uh, are able to be a part of a Christmas pageant. One, uh, this year, the dog uh, participated as Mary's donkey, which was quite hilarious. And, <laughs> uh, but that is so meaningful for the kids, because not only do they know the story, but they're part of the story. And uh, one year, my um, three little nieces are all the same age, and they all wanted to be married. So we had, I, I thought, how are we going to work this? So I had them be, one was Mary at the Annunciation, and one was Mary at the Visitation, and one was Mary at the Nativity. Well, the Mary at the Nativity, her name actually is Mary, and she is a very, very shy child. And when she got in front of the fireplace, which is our stage, she realized that this was not a role for her. So she started crying. And my grandson, who was a very quick-minded little boy, said, Mary is crying tears of joy. <laughs> we just laughed. And I have to tell you something that recently happened, because this is so funny. I have a very interesting little boy this year. He's just so much fun. And we had a, we celebrated the Feast of the Epiphany on the Feast of the Epiphany because that's when we came back to school. And we put the symbols on the door frame and we blessed the classrooms and we read the story. We sang We Three Kings. And, and uh, before Christmas, I did not have uh, the Nativity set out because that was the place where the Advent wreath went. So when they came back, the Nativity set was new. So this little boy came up to it after hearing the story and everything and he looks at it and he goes, Oh, there are the three kings, and they're carrying their gifts, gold, moccasins, and myrrh. 